Well, we're back with The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa and looking at a first conversation. The Nigerian Navy has faulted figures of crude oil being stolen daily in Nigeria by oil thieves as been claimed by the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation. Now, the Navy asked the NNPCL to tell Nigerians the truth about the low level of oil production instead of reeling out figures which are very far from reality. It also accused the NNPCL of hiding the real cause of fuel scarcity in the country by continually blaming it on oil theft. Recall that the group managing uh, group general manager of the National Petroleum Investment Management Services, an agency under the NNPCL, had reportedly claimed Nigeria lost about 470,000 barrels per day, amounting to $700 million monthly. Now, however, the chief of training and operation of the Nigerian Navy, Royal Admiral Solomon Agada, made this accession when he appeared before the Senate Committee on anti-corruption and order finance crime for interact during an interactive session. Agada also revealed that at several meetings with the NNPCL, they had appraised the corporation about the causes of fuel scarcity by telling them that there was no way anyone would steal 1,000, I beg your pardon, 100,000 barrels of oil in a day by the NNPCL had deliberately continue to mislead Nigerians. Now, this conversation is almost endless, but we have to just take a break at this point and invite our guest, Bolaho Olojide, who is an oil and gas expert. He joins us this morning. Thank you so much, Bolaho, for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, so so let, let me take your overview about, you know, this accession by the Navy. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, I, th I think the Navy is in, uh, is in order by saying some of those figures being bandied around are not, uh, you, you can't explain them off by just saying they are uh, oil theft. You see, the resources that are required for that level of stealing is so huge that it, it, it doesn't add up. The numbers are not adding up. That is the reality of what the Navy seems to be saying. So um, there is oil theft, no doubt about that. We have all seen all those uh, connections to our pipelines and several other things, uh, including the vessel that was chased all the way to, uh, uh, to Guinea. So there is oil theft. But there are other issues that we must also be talking about. I, I guess that is what the Navy is, is trying to say. Look, there are issues of infrastructure. Don't forget that for 13 years, we could not pass PIB. A lot of investment that should have been made in our oil and gas uh, 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 sector were not made. So there is serious infrastructure problem. There is also the possibility of thefts that are not happening on the pipelines that are documentary sort of theft, in which two is written for four, or four is written for five, whatever the case may be, either at the offices or at the terminals, whatever the case is. So it's, it's a cocktail of issues that are going on, and it would be wrong to attribute everything to oil theft. It is not correct. Now, but another issue that was raised by, you know, the Navy is that the major terminals have not been able to process fuel for export since around February and uh, March 2022. And there's also another report. You talk about remittance. There's been a zero remittance, you know, to the uh, Federation account or the Commonwealth account, if you like to put. Does this, you know, add up? Is there a correlation with the statement or the you know, position of the Navy and the fact that there's also a report that we have not been able to remit, you know, any amount to the Federation account in terms of our earnings from oil. Okay. Um, the terminal issues that you mentioned, those are the part of the infrastructure problem that I spoke about. The Bonnet terminal, the S travels. There are issues going on with some of our terminals and we need to speak about them. Number two, even the pipelines. I'm aware, for example, that the, uh, the focados, from time to time, it has become almost an annual event that the focados will go down. That is an, a very old pipeline system. 
it'd be like, like five decades, four decades kind of investment that we're talking about. So that when that pipeline goes down, sometimes it takes several months, five months, six months before it comes up. Those are infrastructure challenges. We need to talk about them and not say everything is, is a, is a, is a, a good step. Now, coming to the issue of remittance to the uh, consolidated revenue of the federal government. Now, the NMPC Act allows NMPC to take money for its operations and then remit. The problem with that is that what if the money it will take for its operation is such that by the time it takes that money, there's nothing to remit. It means there will be nothing to go back into the federation account, as simple as that. So you make money from crude, and then you have all these deals for importation of refined products, which is heavily subsidized. So NMPC is making money from the left and is using it to import fuel, refined product, from the right. There's a possibility, indeed, that you, 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 you may, we may not have anything to, to put into the Federation account. That is the reality. Now, the kind of um, inappropriateness uh, that could be going on in that middle, because subsidy in itself, the way we have implemented it in this country, is a very dark hole of unaccountability. So somebody sells crude, makes money on the right, then he uses the money and imports refined products into the, into the country, and he says, by the time I finish import importing the refined product, I don't have anything to remit anymore. What can we do? No, so, but um, I, you have mentioned the issue of infrastructure, which is very critical because um, if you want to also align that with the thoughts of the Navy, uh, it's something that we, we have to agree with. You, you look at you know, the recent revelation from um, the World Bank saying at the pace which we're growing, it might probably take us 300 years you know, to close the infrastructure gap. But what happens to the turnaround maintenance? Okay, uh, looking at 9.5 billion naira for turnaround maintenance that's been invested at the time, especially for you know for 2022. So is that not supposed to? Sorry, to I, I did not hear what you said for a moment. Um, I, I don't know if, if there's a network connectivity issue. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't hear what you said. So. Uh, I'm saying that, you know, from the conversation, you have talked about the deficit in our infrastructure, and which is a reality, of course, the pipelines and what have you. But I like to also mention what happens or what, what about the turnaround maintenance? Uh, if we look at how much we have expended, uh, how much has been spent on, you know, maintaining all of this infrastructure, uh, we're looking at uh, figures reported 9.5 billion naira. Okay, uh, I still did not hear what you say, but I will just make some other general comments on the subject matter. Um, on the on the issue of infrastructure investment, we are way behind. Everybody in Nigeria must have seen the viral video of how uh, people monitor uh, oil. oil. Oil oil production is monitored in Saudi Arabia. So, in the space of technology, so we have deployed some technology, but obviously. We have a long way to go. Uh, the issue of uh, lack, uh, uh, flow meet, lack meters to be used at our flow meters and, and, and all of those things apparently have still not been put in place. We must be able to monitor in real time the oil production from the various oil wells that we have in Nigeria. And it shouldn't require people jumping into the bush to go and chase uh, where the pipelines are located. Technology is doing all of these things. So we must be ready to invest a little more in technology to solve the problem. On the matter of, uh, on, 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 on the subject matter of uh, uh, um, refined products, for us, the solution will be, as a country, to be able to, um, I, I don't know if you're still hearing me. I think there's something wrong yes, with the net. I can net. hear you. I can hear you. If we have infrastructure issues with, you know, the oil sector, should the turnaround maintenance uh, funding not cater for that? I mean, should that not solve the problem? We have seen that, you know, the TUC have also accused the government of uh, 9.5 billion naira that has been, you know, spent on turnaround maintenance. So should that amount not cater for the issue of infrastructure 
in terms of you know the oil sector okay um let's separate uh two segments of the oil sector now the crude <clears throat> It's a, it's a totally different ballgame from the imported refined product. When, or, if, or refining generally, there is the upstream, which is where the crude comes from. And the issue of refining is midstream to, 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 to the downstream. So the midstream, which is where this refining is taking place, is another segment of the oil sector. The infrastructure for refining is not going to cater to the infrastructure need for the upstream sector. So the issues of uh, pipelines for transporting crude, the issues of uh, large flow meters, the issues at the terminals, production issues, those are different set of infrastructure requirements as opposed to the infrastructure for the refining of crude, which is what uh, the turnaround maintenance and the rest is taking care of. So, but um, an overview now, what, what, what do you think would be the way out of all of this? You see, the, 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 the way out is that we need to just be a little bit more serious about our oil and gas sector because it is so critical to our survival, at least in the short to medium term. It is so critical. 90% or over 90% of Nigerians' foreign exchange come from exportation of crude. It's from crude oil. Meanwhile, when you look at our crude production, from November 2005, I believe, it has been on the decline. In that November, we had about 2.5 million barrels production per day on the average. And since that time, if you pick up the plot, you will see how everything has declined up until 2022. In 2022, the decline even got much steeper. So we're not investing. We must invest in infrastructure. Number two is the issue of transparency. In, 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 in the words of the former president, this, this oily oil, oil business is a, a very oily business. A lot of graft issues, corruption issues, is so endemic. Many things are not transparent. We need to get more transparent about how we deal with the oil business. We also need to employ technology much more than we are doing today. Some of the things we're asking people to go and sit in the creek and be watching pipelines have been done in a room in some other parts of the world. Can we learn to do that? Some of the stealing or irregularity that might be happening at the export terminals will also be dealt with uh, with technology as well. So let's invest more in technology. Let's be more transparent and let's be willing to invest more in our oil and gas infrastructure. No, but if the federal government uh, has invested in the maritime domain, uh, you know, facility or infrastructure just to help with the navy in dictating illegal theft because it feels like we have everything in place so how then do we still have all of these issues of theft uh, there's an investment in that regard in terms of you know um stopping all of these issues and so we still have yeah. the issue of theft which might not necessarily be the major issue so what exactly are we dealing with because it, it, it's almost very confusing on the other hand the navy has been accused of not being capable of protecting the waterways and that's why we're having all of these issues and the navy is saying hey we're doing our bid that's not the case we have what it takes you know um to stop all of this so what is really going on in the l sector and how do we even stop this issue? Right now, there's a lot of you know, um, issues with fear of scarcity, and it, it's telling on the economy. We see that the cost of transportation is on the hike, and every other thing is also probably on the high as well. OK, I, I, I will start from the, uh, the issue of uh, increasing price or non-availability of fuel in the PMS and the market. Now, when I said we have to be a bit more transparent in our dealings, if you, if you ask the uh, uh, oil marketers today, the, the, the independent oil marketers, they have a totally different story from what NMPC will tell you about why there is no foil in Lagos. NMPC last week was telling us that it was because of road repairs that we, we don't have oil, uh, foil to buy in Lagos. On the other hand, the marketers are saying, look, the amount I'm picking the product at the, at the uh, uh, tank farm has changed. Therefore, I'm unable to pick it at those prices and still sell at the regulated price. If you see a place today 
where people are selling at above pump price, there will be no queue. And, every, and, and people who have traveled out of Lagos will tell you that you just drive in. If the price is uh, 260 or whatever, you drive in, you won't see any queue there. So why will an NPC then come out and say that the reason that there is fuel problem is because there is no, uh, there is a, they, they are fixing road in Napapa, that that is the reason. We have to be more transparent. The communications must make sense. There has to be an articulated manner of, you know, addressing the members of the public, telling them the truth about what exactly is going on. That is that is on one side. You spoke about investment in the maritime era. Yes, yeah, there have been investment in the in technology for for the, that the navy can use to know. Oh, there's a there's a there's a ship somewhere waiting to burn. But that is not that is at the end. When does the ship comes in? The ship comes in. There has been production in the field. Production have moved from through the pipelines. It has gotten to the terminal. From the terminal, it is to be exported. It is at the point of exportation that we have the issues of, uh, oh, I can see a ship that is loading. The question is, what has happened from the production to the pipeline to the terminal? Those are all points where anything could have happened to what is going on. So at the production level, are we able to monitor the oil that is being produced across Nigeria today? Are we able to? Is a question to ask. Now, in the pipeline, we have situations in which even production, the producers are saying, I put in 100 into the pipeline. At the other end, it is 50 that is coming out. There is no way Navy can deal with that. That is not something that Navy can see. So there are other questions before you get to that point where oil is being loaded onto a vessel. And we must address everything that happens across the entire chain. The entire chain can be policed by technology. So, so still with that now, you also still have the Navy saying that as at this moment, that there's no tanker or no, you know, vessel that can come into the waterways, the Nigerian waterways without their notification. They will definitely know. The only time that will not happen is if they turn off you know, um, what it is. But the Navy, they have what it takes to know when you have an external element coming into the space. That's what they are saying. So why then do you we see, still keep talking about theft? They are, they, we, we all saw those uh, pipelines that were hooked on to our pipe. That is number one. Number two is how internal control works. You see, internal control can collapse in any structure once there is collusion. The, the, the case that the Navy was describing is the ideal situation. There could be situation in which there are compromises. Compromises that will even involve the Navy. See, we've seen in this country in some years past where vessels, entire vessels, were being diverted off the coast, or off, 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 off Kutunu. People will bring in imported products into this country. And on the high sea, they would dispose of that. They would sell it off Kutunu and come to Nigeria and claim subsidy. Was the Navy not around there? They were around. Was, was the entire Navy structure involved in that kind of a thing? I don't think so. But can there be compromises? The answer is yes. So there could be compromises at the level of Navy. There could be compromises at the level of NMPC. The kind of theft that we are seeing now, did you remember the comment made by the MB of Chevron? He said it is organized crime. In an organized crime situation, the number of parties, players that are involved is extensive. And once these parties agree to work together, they can make a mess of any system. The, the MD of Chevron is in a position to know what is going on in the oil and gas situation. So if he tells you that there is an organized crime that is going on, there is an organized crime that is actually going on, the Navy has excluded itself, which is expectedly so. What we now need to do, if we're serious, is at the highest decision level, 
making a, a, a person or, or, or organ, we need to give directives to all these institutions to work together. A situation in which the Nigeria customs, customs will go to the north and the NMPC will go to the, to, the, to the south and the marketers will go to the east, everybody talking it, from several segments of, 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 of uh, how it concerns them, trying to put the blame on other people will not work. It is a chain. And if there is a problem along any part in that chain, it will not work. So all the participants, all the stakeholders across the entire chain must work together if we are going to make any, any, any uh, uh, headway in this matter. So Navy and NMPC and Customs and you know Ministry of uh, 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 Petroleum, everybody must work together. Under a directive by the CEO at the top, the CEO is, is the president, the minister, the minister, is also the Minister of Petroleum. Well, um, just quickly as we coast this down now, uh, it will be my final question to you. With the discovery of you know new oil wells, especially in Belchia and Gombe, and the fact that they're fighting, is this a plus to the oil sector? Not necessarily so. Uh, discovery of oil um, is good from the perspective of some sort of balancing. There have been all this talk about, oh, oil come from the south. Now there is oil in the north. Oil in the north has been found in a landlocked area, so there are serious logistic issues that has to be dealt with. Uh, for us to even know the extent of viability of this discovery. The other part that is important that Nigeria must pay attention to is the fact that Bayelsa State has been an oil producing country forever. In fact, Olo Iberi, which was where the, the, the first oil uh, uh, discovery was, is in Bayelsa. However, that same Bayelsa is number two on the list of the states with multi dimensional poverty in this country. Despite the fact that it is also the state with the highest per capita income in Nigeria. So that they found oil in your state, it doesn't mean a thing. It is how that resources is managed and deployed to the benefit of the citizen that will make a difference in their life, not the discovery of oil. Oil is in Bayelsa. Bayelsa is number two on the poverty league table today. Well, uh, we have to go now. Thank you so much. The pleasure is. He's an oil and gas uh, analyst expert right there. He joined us this morning to make sense, you know, of the uh, new revelation and, you know, from the Navy as regards oil theft and, you know, the oil sector generally, especially with some of the claims and proclamations from the NNPCL. That's the size of it. We take a break and when we return, would continue with the breakfast. Please stay with us.